Hello and welcome to our 26 uh, community stand-up. <laughs> I have no idea what numbers we're in. Um, we're going to get to number 26 and you're going to confuse people because they're going to go, it's 26. And yeah, every single week you say 26. I think that is true. So yeah, my name is Imo Landworth. Um, I'm a program manager on the .NET team and today we have a special guest. Hi, I'm Andy Goki. Uh, I've been on the C Sharp compiler team for about seven, eight years now. And uh, that's mainly what I'm working on these days. Awesome. I'm Kathleen Dollard. Uh, I work on the .NET Core CLI SDK, some on languages. I'm the Visual Basic PM, and I work on the C Sharp, uh, the C Sharp uh, language design team. And uh, also, I do MS Build. So I'm a PM. For, I'm a PM. That's why I do so many things. I actually do nothing. Okay, <laughs> I just help other people. Yeah, I'm a developer. So <laughs> yeah, uh, it, is, it is a developer. I'm not as polished as the rest. Emo and I are PMs, so we have no excuse if we're not. Well, together. I think you're underplaying the PM role. The one thing that we do really well is deleting emails. I think I think we don't get <laughs> enough credit for that. I feel like that is trippy something on my connect this year. Email <laughs> management, it's important. It is. And, and the usual rule is if you don't mail me four times, it's clearly not important enough for me to take a look at. That's my that's my vacation <laughs> policy. If you don't email me again, then I'm just it's declare bankruptcy. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we take our jobs way more seriously than it sounds right now. <clears throat> At least that's what we say. Um, all right, so then actually let me try to figure out which of these 500 buttons does what I want. So now we have fancy transitions and stuff. Yay. So in case you didn't notice, but we shipped, we shipped. .NET Core 3.1. And 3.1 is amazing for two reasons. One of them is it reminds me of Windows for Workgroups for some reason. But um, more importantly, it is the LTS version of .NET Core 3X. So that is the one that will be supported for a very long time. If you're on 3.0, you should um, consider moving to 3.1. That's kind of like the, the short summary of it. But there's also a blog post that goes into way more detail in all the stuff that we have done uh, in 3.0 as well, because clearly if you're working from 2x, moving to 3.1 is also interesting for all the 3.0 features, obviously. Um, the big ones are WinForms and WPF, which I think you may have heard of. Uh, there's also a new version of .NET Standard, but that's not like the, the killer feature of the platform, I would say, at this point. Um, yeah, there's a lot of like small improvements all over the board. So it's a, it's a pretty beefy release. Lots of, lots of in, in, interesting stuff. Uh, Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Um, well, on the, on the release, I think uh, we're, we're good. There's, there is um, a couple things around it, uh, both what we're doing with the SDK that changes now and uh, what the support policy is, what LTS means. You said, you know, it's 3.1, it's LTS, it's going to be supported for a while. But, you know, what exactly does that mean? And what are the implications for other uh Yeah, what does it versions? mean? What does it mean? Okay. <laughs> so LTS is long-term support, and we have a support policy. Uh, we'll bring it up here in just a minute. But the, uh, <coughs> the support policy says that something marked LTS is supported for three years. Something that's not marked LTS is also called current, but an LTS may also be current. So I'll just say LTS and non-LTS. Neither 2.2 nor 3.0 are LTS. 2.1 and 3.1 are LTS. Going forward, we expect it will not continue to be .1 numbers, so that just happens right now. Um, but the next version coming out November of 2020 is 5.0. That will not be LTS. And then 6.0 coming out in 2021, November, will be LTS. So here's the dates when things uh, go out of support, if we've got the right thing up. Um, and yes, so we've got, the important thing, the important pieces here is that uh, .NET Core 2.2 goes out of support on December 23rd. And I want to make sure we understand, we explain exactly what that means. So it will not stop working. If you have it on your machine, it will all continue to work. We will do absolutely nothing to undermine your use of .NET Core 2.2, to be clear. However, we do regular updates, approximately monthly. And when the next update comes out, which would predictably be January, um, around Patch Tuesday is what we, uh, we aim to match that with, then you will, we will not have an update to 2.2 in January because it's after the support ends. And if that release, if that update in January, um, if that patch is a security patch, then you would not get that security patch. And so similarly for February, we won't have a 2.2. And in March, um, the actual 
uh, Patch Tuesday will come before March 23rd, so you could expect a patch if there was one needed for 3.0 in March, but not in April. So in April, starting in April, we'll just be um, providing patches for 2.1 and 3.1 until we get around to 5.0. So if you want a long term, I don't have to change my production code very often, then you're going to want to be on one of these LTS runtimes. Um, it means you don't get the latest and greatest stuff though. So if possible, we do encourage people to be on current and then just to switch over. We try hard not to make breaking changes, but we have, um, we're partnering with you with control for all of that in .NET Framework, somebody just updated your machine, and did a Windows update, and voila, you have a new version. Uh, now you have a lot more control of that, but it does mean that we have to have these conversations. Yeah, I think the other thing that is interesting about what you just said is like, because .NET Core is side by side, the cool thing is you can be on latest for some projects on the machine, and you can be on LTS for the more mature, the mission critical things, whatever, right? So like the nice thing is, unless of .NET Framework, you basically have to make a decision, do I want to experience latest and greatest, or do I want to keep my existing apps running? You, you don't have to make that choice anymore. You can basically have your cake and eat it too kind of thing, and then right. it's a case by case thing for application, what you want to do. And that's run with the TFM in your project file. That's what says what version uh, you're going to be uh, trying to target. And then if that version's not on the machine, there's a roll forward policy, uh, which you can instigate at a couple of places, including in your project file, uh, including on a machine. If you have something you need to run and the person owning the machine needs to say, please roll forward. Uh, and <clears> that's <throat> under the runtime roll forward policy, if we've got it documented. Yep. I know that it's also under designs. Um, so I think <clears> you'll find that if not, uh, you can shoot one of us an email or uh, ask in the questions and I'll try to look it up. I think that probably should be a demo mm -hmm. that we do at some point, like how do you modify your project file to like have the different policies. Right, and also how you do that, uh, you can also do it in a in releases, is it releases.config? There's a file that is on the production machine and you can modify that file. And that's also going to allow you to specify that roll forward from the perspective of the owner of the machine, not just the owner of the um, the author of the code, mm -hmm. and you can do it with an environmental variable. So there's multiple routes to actually doing that rule forward. All of which we just talked about is about the runtime, right? Not the not the SDK. Yeah, I think we use runtime JSON and config for that. Yeah. The compiler actually Thank compiles you. for I two, have the wrong name. two one or two two, because we have uh, we have servicing for two one and two two, so we right. compile against the two one two two, and then we, for deployment in 3.0, we bump it up to 3.0. We yeah. test, obviously, but uh, things just work. Yeah, you only have a few tests, I think like only 500,000 or something like this, like. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we have a few, like <laughs> we have a few unit tests to make sure things work properly. But uh, yeah, we, we test on the newer runtimes, but we target to the old just in case. So one question from Morton is, could we potentially see a 5.1 minor update between 5.0 and 6.0? My understanding is that we're not planning on doing that. We, we basically try to stick to 5.0.6.0.7.0.8.0, but we will most likely end up shipping previews, obviously, in between. And I don't know how many previews you will ship, but of course you want to get bits into the hands of people to actually get feedback. I would believe, though, that tooling-wise, you probably ship more updates than just major versions, right? So, right, we have the distinction between the runtime and the tools, which is always important to keep in right. mind. For the runtime, it'll surprise me a bit if we do a dot one in the middle of that year. We had a two dot one because we were looking at our numbering a little bit differently and we were basing it, basing it more on how big the changes were going to be. Now we've decided to go on a predictable cycle because right. we think that's better for people. And with that change, with only a year, the runtime changing within a year is highly unlikely. The tools, however, will change um, approximately every quarter, and for many reasons, we wind up uh, aligning tools like, with the Visual Studio release cycle. Even if you're not using Visual Studio, the update to the tools happen to align with that cycle, so it's good to know that. And uh, we expect that we will have updates going forward approximately every quarter. Uh, and we don't own that schedule, Visual Studio. Yeah. Uh, we just align with their schedule because it's one of our major delivery vectors is inside Visual Studio. Yeah, there's one question that uh, keeps coming up quite a bit that people say, like, why is 2.2 not LTS, but 2.1 is LTS? And the short answer for that is 
like realistically, LTS means for us that we have to support a particular snapshot of the product indefinitely, right? And so we already said that 2.1 is LTS. So that means if we ship a 2.2, now we would have to have 2.1 LTS and 2.2 LTS, which now doubles the amount of branches we have to maintain, the amount of fixes we have to push out. And that's just not reasonable for, for, for anybody. So what we ended up saying is like, yeah, if you're on 2.2, in order for you to get to support, you have to move to the 3.1. Uh, which is where the next LTS version that includes all the bits from 2.2, but also more. But we will not have multiple v LTSs, uh, you know, for minor versions within the product cycle. That that would be insane. And we also decided that uh, as we were as we were uh, working on the policy, that was sort of going on about the same time. And the idea is that we'll have a uh, LTS about every two years. Right. And uh, it didn't line up exactly, <clears throat> but 2.2 kind of fell in that uh, that two-year period. So, uh, yeah. And, and I know this is kind of new for folks, so ask all the questions you want. This is uh, actually important stuff for people to understand. Uh, and I don't think we've done a brilliant job of talking about it. And the other thing I want to point out is, like, why do we change our release cycles? If you look at the dates here... Like you would be hard pressed to predict the next date in the release date column. And uh, that's why we basically moved to a release cadence where we said, okay, if we ship once a year, we'll ship in November every year. And so that also means given the ELTS policies, which basically means, you know, once the next version comes out, the previous run is supported for I think two more years, you can predict now when things are happening because you know when the dates are. Like in this case, it's like, well, you don't know how long the support is because it basically only starts ticking when the next one is out. And if the release date is unknown, then it's a guessing game how long you actually have. So and the new model is all predictable. We got a question that I think will help clarify some of what you're saying, which is that the question is, does this mean 6.0 will replace uh, the 3.1 LTS? And then if so, uh, let's see, what does it say? If 5.0 is not LTS, right. So 6.0 will be the next LTS. And part of what that means is that six, when 6.0 is released, that starts the one year clock ticking on 3.1. So 3.1 is going to be um, we're get supported, which means you get patches for it. We will release patches for 3.1 for, uh, for the longer of, it was, it's at least three years from the release of 3.1 and one year from the release of its replacement, which will be 6.0. So you could expect, uh, well, I will say stronger than that. We our policy is we will support uh, 3.1 for three years from its release, which will be approximately the same time as one year from the release of 6.0. Those will align generally, and then we'll pick the month and date based on exactly what our release date is for uh, for 6.0. Right. If it releases in November, as we expect, then it will be. Uh, what was the date of our of our blog post? It will be uh, three years from last week. So Morton is asking, can you talk about why LTS versions have breaking changes but non-LTS won't? That approach makes it tricky for third-party library developers to ship on, for instance, 3.0 before 3.1 comes out, but the lifespan for that is very short, and then you're shortly after breakups with 3.1 release, and customers are forced to move to 3.1 because 3.0 is also not a support before we have changes to releases and new update. I think so. There's a, I think that there's an implication here the way Morton asked the question of like that we intend to make breaking changes when we do LTSs. That's normally not what ends up happening. Is what ends up happening is that because an LTS is supported for a very long time, that is basically the last chance that we have to cut things out that we don't want to support long time. And so basically, I think the one that, that you may refer to is in the WinForms blog post, there was a few controls that we removed that were deprecated for like pretty much in, you know since 2005, I believe. And so the basically it was discovered after 3.0 was shipped that there's a bunch of work that needs to happen for those controls. I think around accessibility and other work items that we just didn't feel very uh, interested in doing, considering that the control is pretty much outdated since 2005. So I think that was that is pretty much why you see these th these kind of things. But generally speaking, that's also why I think the new release cycle will help because you have basically uh, an LTS every other year, and then you have major up versions every year uh, with major features, and that gives us more runway to auto communicate when things go out. Right from 3.0 to 3.1, it was only a couple months. That's also no longer the case, right? Now we, you have basically 12 months in between. We never want to do that again. We yeah. never want to have three months between two <clears throat> releases like that. It was difficult for for you to uptake, 
and it was difficult for us to pull off. So uh, part of that was because we were transitioning here and because you know, we wanted very much to get wind forms and WPF into people's hands, but it's kind of obvious that we, we had some challenges with that. And 3.0 did not do everything we wanted to do in wind forms, and so we really needed to get that, uh, that 3 one out to help plug the holes. And unfortunately, as plugging the holes on that, we did find some things, and so it was not as smooth as we would like it to be. Right. All right. I do want to talk that. about uh, I want to talk about SDK before we leave this topic, but I first want to make sure we've got the runtime completely covered for folks. So yeah, everything we said so far is runtime. Yeah, for the C sharp perspective, um, we, we don't generally regard breaking changes as like really ever okay. So <laughs> we I, we all try to to limit them. Um, we. We also sometimes get into a box where, in the case of the wind forms, there was simply a mistake made. Uh, the tools, the things that were pulled out, probably shouldn't have gone in. The, yeah, and so things happen. You know, things happen. We uh, we do try not to do that. Um, and so there's a question <laughs> on upgrading. How to upgrade .NET 4.5 to .NET Core? Is there another question before? You Are there other questions? No. It's not an upgrade. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not, not an port, upgrade. Um, which is so, slightly different, but. That there's, so we kind of wince a little bit at that because there's one thing you might not be expecting that's actually one of the challenges, but you can do it ahead of time while you're in 4.5, and that can, make, can smooth the transition. And so uh, that's working on your project file. So the project system is new. In uh, we switched it, and you can run the new project system against 4.5 and do some of those updates, particularly around packages. Are you good at talking about actually changing to uh, from packages config to project file? I mean, I can. I mean, like it's not very hard. I mean, like the way you do it is there's actually just a right click experience. You can just right click oh, your package.config okay. and say migrate to do package that. reference. <laughs> That, that's the easiest way. And then you, from there, you basically just have to migrate the project file, for which we also have a tool. If you go to our .NET uh, organization on GitHub, there's a new repo called try-convert. And that is basically a command line tool that you can use to migrate your project files, which gets you pretty which close. Which might work. <laughs> and it might just <clears throat> not work, too. So it's, a, it's set up for the easy case. And a lot of you are in the easy case. And a lot of you, this will save a ton of time for. And a lot of you that are not in the easy case, it will save a bunch of grunt work for. But it's not a push the button, and it will guaranteed work. It's a push the button, and it might work. Yeah. And so, like, I, I want to qualify this a little bit. Like, let me first go actually there to actually some people yeah, what the tool is, what the tool looks like. So this is basically the the GitHub page, and then I think there's a there's a sample in here too where. Uh, basically, you just run this tool, and then here's the command and options that you have. Basically, in short, the, the tool will work reasonably well. Like I've used it on my own projects uh, quite a bit. It, so the more standardized or standard the your project file is, meaning th th if you have made customizations yourself of MS Build, it will have a much much harder time. If it's basically vanilla file new project plus right click modifications like adding references and source files. Like I have not seen it, it not working. Like there's always some corner cases where you have a particular, you know, special projects. But the one thing that I ported was console apps just fine, class libraries just fine, uh, UI apps just fine. Where it struggles a lot more is web because web is uh, a lot more complicated the way the project files are being done there. But you know, for class libraries and 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 UI apps and and console apps, if it's basically vanilla fun your project uh, kind of thing, then. I have not seen any problems. So like I think for the vast majority of you, it will probably just work fine. But as it is with any port, right, you have to, you know, the behavior also has changed, right? Like once you once you move to .NET Core, you know, make sure you run unit tests if you have any. <laughs> uh, if you don't have any, then you just right, give, unit tests. give it to your customers and see what happens, right? But like I think the, the idea is, you, yeah, you it's a port, so you have to, of course, test your stuff after you're done, right? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to Emo, no. <laughs> <laughs> write tests. Every, all of you write tests. API, uh, API port is a tool that you can use ahead of time to find out uh, how many um, things that you may be using that might be uh, not there. And running that ahead of time uh, can show you if you have a problem, give you a comfort factor if you don't have problems. So that's definitely worth uh, doing first. So uh, do we have anything else going on that's new? we got a couple people talking about conversion, which is great. Thank you very much for being there and talking to us. We're so happy that that we're not just talking to each other. Uh, much more interesting. Yeah, the one thing I would say though is like when you move to core, the one thing that will change quite a bit is that 
you know, in the past we have considered the project files to be a designer generated artifact that you basically don't have to modify by hand ever. And this is one thing that we changed, and we basically said the project file is source code. And we did a bunch of work in the SDK style projects to make it so that it's not 400 lines of a lot of goo. So moving forward, you should treat your project files as source code. And there's a bunch of things you can do to you know, repeat, uh, not repeat yourself, you know, factor things out, and making things customizable. And we also added a bunch of properties into the project file so that you can actually customize, for example, how uh, NuGet packages are being built, uh, you know, what assembly information you have is no longer generated in a CS file. It's actually part of the project file, which means you can now use sharing. You can actually compute values. You can compute version numbers as opposed to writing them into the text files yourself. And so this is all stuff you can do. And then it also means that moving forward, hopefully, migration of project files is easier because it's just your source code and you know what's in there rather than some tool generated for the lines that you don't something understand. Something scary. It's no longer something scary. Yeah. It's no, it's uh, we actually makes cut clear. by like 50%. I've not seen GUID in, yeah. the, in the new form, in the new form. Yeah, like, neither have I. I mean, Which the only the best part. Yeah, the only thing is solution files are unchanged, so we had to put the GUID somewhere. It's all GUIDs. <laughs> moved all the GUIDs. Yes. Yeah, I, th I still think somebody should get a, uh, an award for that because they managed to create a text file that is not human editable. That is quite a feat. I, I, I have to say that. Yeah. Congratulations so, on that. So, so you want to talk about the SDK <laughs> for a minute? Me. No, no. Do you want me to? No, you could. You, you should feel free to talk about sure, it. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Uh, we really recommend people use the latest SDK. Can build all previous runtimes, and we confused people on that by releasing stuff like a two dot one dot eight hundred, and uh, that uh, that led to a certain amount of confusion. So when you're working with um, the tools, the only difference between uh, for example, um, I think I'll get this this set right if I don't apologize, but uh, 2.1.400 and uh, 2.2.800, the only difference between those two series, both of which um, went out um, adjacent to 16.2, the only thing different between them is one is uh, compiled against the 2.1 runtime and one is compiled against the 2.2 runtime. And when you're building, you don't care what runtime your tools were compiled against. Um, we had a different idea in the past of that maybe you would only want to one on your machine and we were making things easier. And as a, but as a result, we wound up with an ex, kind of a mess in our downloads and very difficult to understand the SDKs. So going forward, the recommended plan is to use the latest, which is 3.1.100, and it will build 2.1, 2.2, I believe it will still build 1.0. And so uh, that's the recommendation. Um, if you feel that you need a different, uh, like a 3.0 um, 100 or something else in the 3.0 series, then uh, we, are going to, we are not going to be updating those in the same way that we did before. We're going to be updating just the tip. And so you may need to pick up a runtime in order to have that be um, fully patched. And I am working on a blog post on that. But the important thing here is that you there is not a, a 2.1 or a 2.2 that aligns with either Visual Studio 16.3 or 16.4. So the reason is that the tools that would align with those are the 3.10, I'm sorry, 3.0.100 or 3.1.100 tools. And those tools are released only compiled against 3.1. So if you want to target an older runtime, just get that runtime. And then you'll have the, the single copy of the tools, which would be a much simpler story to explain to people going forward for you to be able to understand what you want to get off of our website and then separately get the runtime that you actually do want to target. So this is like, the, the message is basically like, get the largest version number? For the SDK? Uh, like, yeah, so yeah, the go, latest, right. Go and grab the latest it's, it's version easier. number. It's even easier than that. Go to the .NET Downloads page and push the Get an SDK button, and you'll get the right thing. Yeah. So we're, we're working on making that super simple. Uh, we unfortunately didn't get tooling in place to be able to pick an earlier runtime from a UI super easily right now, except through Visual Studio, which does allow you to just check, I want to also... Uh, uh, target 2.1 or 2.2. But th then you just say something like target framework 2.1 in your project file, and it's like, yeah, you can use the latest. So, for example, you can use right. the latest compiler 
to compile for 2.1, and really you should because maybe we fix some bugs in yeah, the fr- in that should. time frame. So yeah. like. The only thing to add to that is that where I was talking about getting the older runtime, that's because somewhere you have to get it on your machine if you're going to test. Right. And you do want that to be patched. That's you know that's the right thing to do. And so then you can go into the Willow, uh, I'm sorry, the Visual Studio <laughs> Installer, which we lovingly call Willow, uh, but the Visual Studio Installer and uh, individual components. And you can check that and you can get what you need. Uh, and uh, there you go. And then for the, uh, if you work on the CLI, you want to get it from the website, then you just need to go into the uh, 2.1 or 2.2 pages and grab the latest runtime. Yeah, so you can grab your runtime and then just use the latest tools and right. hopefully get right. fixes and all that other stuff. So let's, oh. let's go, let's talk about this for it. Because if I yeah. click on this guy, I say download Core SDK, mm-hmm. and then you I get go 3.1. here. You get 3.1.100, unless we have a terrible bug. Mm-hmm. So here is some page that eventually will zoom. So I now get something that is the, is the 100 version. Uh-huh. But I guess the, the interesting thing is, OK, now it's zoomed finally, is this yellow banner here, right? Because basically what I'm getting right now is the thing that is compatible with the latest version of VS, basically, right? And then if I want another version, I have to click on this guy. And then here is where I right. get the, the, the breakout. Yeah, right? if, you're always, if you're using an older version of Visual Studio, then obviously the tools that ship in Visual Studio will be out of date with the newer version of the SDK. So there's a bit of mix and matching there, uh, which is why the recommendation is always also be on the newest version of Visual Studio. <laughs> right. So the, the, the break that can happen there is Visual Studio, because it's not tested with a higher version. The Visual Studio is obviously not tested with the future. It's tested with today when it's released. So something like 16.3 is tested against 3.0.100. So therefore, there's actually a mark in it that says the highest it will run against is 3.0.100. And the purpose for that gold bar there, that t- that warning, is to tell you that if you're running Update 3, Visual Studio 2019, Update 3, which we call 16.3, um, if you're running that and you download 16.4, there's you you don't you haven't downloaded the right thing. It's particularly serious in Visual Studio for Mac, which we broke them uh, in one of the 2.2 releases. And this is a warning to help keep people from getting uh, broken. You only would have a problem if you uninstalled things from your Visual Studio and then you went and you were trying to reinstall them. It's a fairly small case uh, where that matters. But the other thing in the transition is that we failed to see the impact of not releasing 2.1.800, which is out of support. The 2.1.8xx series is out of support, and that's also 2.2.4xx. And so at the moment, we have a different highest and latest. So I recommend people use 802 and then install the newest runtime. If you're in that, we'll fix that in January. We'll not fix that. But if you go to the website, it's a little confusing because uh, we released an update to 607, I think it is. But we released an update to the 600 series, but not the 800 series. And that's because 800 is out of support. But because it's the highest, I think we're going to fix we We plan to fix it in January just because it's confusing. That's a lot of numbers. And it is. I'm already it's confused. Only, it's only, <laughs> we're going to fix There's something so, confusing that will be fixed. So my recommendation is just be on the latest. Just be on and latest. you don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. dot .600, which and means absolutely nothing to me. You, you're doing 2.1 <laughs> development. That's great. If you don't have a global.json, you can put 2.1. SDK on your machine and 3.1 SDK on your machine, target 2.1, and you're using the 3.1 SDK right now. So it uses the highest one that's sitting on your machine. So you do not need 2.1 uh, SDK unless you have a specific reason that you need it, which is generally uh, because you have a, a misbuild property that somebody ran into later or some sort of a weird, uh, you know, for, yeah, yeah uh, problems, weird you should change. know it. If you have a problem, if you have a problem, great. And there's some people that just desperately want to, you know, pen to one thing, I, and we don't, we're not going to block you from doing that. I think we need a, a sort of like a, a, a standard for SDKs where we can say oh, there's a version so number. There's a version number that everybody less. implements. We want less. Yeah, the standard <laughs> this is, is the standard the is the standard is use the latest build. Like. And then the standard is going forward, starting in 3.0, there will not be this massive number of SDKs to pick from. We're done yeah. with that. And if you're worried about bugs, don't worry. There are tons of bugs in the older releases. So, <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, like some people say, like, it's confusing, and it, it is confusing, but like, that is, 
that is fundamentally the nature of the game, right? I mean, I, I worked on, on API versioning. I still work on API versioning, as it turns out. And the problem is the more vehicles you have that can version and ship independently, right? The harder the combinations get, right? And that is, people said like in the past, we didn't move fast enough. Now we are moving faster. Well, that means more trains and that means you need to basically look at the train schedule to understand like which thing goes where, right? And that's, not everybody wants that, but the easy fix is if you just want to move fast and you don't mind that sometimes you have, you're on a, on a version that we introduced to break and change, then always being on latest is a really good idea. So I want to get us off this, but I'll say one final thing, which is if you use Visual Studio, just let Visual Studio manage your SDK and you will be fine. Oh yeah, Visual Studio. Visual Studio, we've 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 got that running the way we want we want it. We oh we do have one small problem. The only problem is <laughs> if, no, don't talk about it. No, no, I do. I have to. If you upgrade, yeah, no problems. Very quick. This is an install problem. If you upgrade from 3.0 to 3.1, and your runtime for 3.0 disappears. Just go in and check it and get it back, and I'm sorry. Okay. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. I'm, I'm just, we just have a bug. It's a bug. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm done. I don't want to talk about this anymore. So let's talk about something, Any more questions? something less confusing now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Source generator. I don't know why. Like no, every, wow. every community stand-up, we spend at least half an hour to talk about versioning. It's almost like we're obsessed with versioning. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe it's like another, your PMs or something. Oh my gosh. Soon we'll be done. <laughs> Soon we'll be done. We, we are working out ourselves out of this hole, I promise. Uh, I, at least I hope so, because I'm... You I think more devs on here, so you talk about versioning less. No, I think the problem is, <laughs> every time somebody says our versioning is broken, we end up with one more versioning scheme. Um, so No, no, we're not winding up with a new versioning scheme here. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 we have new plans, new plans, new plans, but not a scheme. All right, not since Andy is here, let, let's talk about something that involves curly braces. <laughs> something very simple. Something with code. Generators. <laughs> something with code. Yeah. Do you have a mechanism to... Make it easier for us to emit version numbers. Is that is that what you're working on? No, he's not. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we're just gonna emit random ones now. <laughs> this doesn't matter. <laughs> we should just. It's all SHAs. You only grab a SHA, and that's it. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Perfect. They don't compare, so it's good. Yeah. No, you can't. You can't tell what you have. You don't know where you're going. It's great. So. Uh, <laughs> So one of the interesting things about one something we said we were going to talk about here today is that I'm on the language design team, but I uh, was traveling and I had a couple of things going on. So I missed a set of meetings where I know nothing about what we're doing with source generators. And some of that work builds on things that were done two or three years ago in the language design team before I joined Microsoft. So other than the fact that I've had a lot of opinions in the history historically about this space, I kind of wrote a book and stuff, but uh, but right now I have no, no idea what they're planning on doing. And so um, I am really looking forward to Andy explaining to me the plan for source generation, and uh, hopefully I'll like it. Yeah, I might tell him if we'll we're see. Done. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can give like a brief history of um, of the feature and kind of the problem space. So the the interesting thing is we looked at this probably two to three years ago. And uh, some people might have seen the original uh, discussions and some of the original design documents. We had a prototype that was built by another developer on the C Sharp compiler team, Chuck. And we had some language features that were proposed in the language design uh, team to kind of support this general feature called source generators, which um, I'm not particularly describing what it is because it honestly wasn't fully thought about what it was. Like, this was an exploration. So we wanted to say, hey, there's a lot of times where I'd like to generate some code. Um, and it's not as easy as it should be. The answer is, a lot of people generate code today. It's not as though we don't already have source generators. It's just, we have source generators in probably 10 different forms across 10 different products. The most common thing is you you do it in MS Build. You add like a, a separate pre-compile step or something, and then because MS build pre-compile steps can have other pre-compile steps inserted in the, in the middle of them, you're like, you just pray that you're not going to get conflicts with like <laughs> another source generation thing. And, and there's tons of source generated code in the, uh, in the libraries today, like uh, ResX, for example, like yep. uh, resource files or assembly info, right? Yep. That's the modern SDK, like that writes out a C-sharp file. Yep. That C-sharp file gets included in your compilation, et cetera. And there are a number of problems that we saw that weren't strictly 
language problems. It wasn't people being unable to express a specific like type theory problem or something inside C Sharp. It was more like, um, here's this domain specific code that I have to write. It's really laborious. It's really hard to maintain. And all of, it's, all of it could be automated. There's really no reason why I should have to handwrite this every time. Um, so we started exploring the space. And we ended up with this idea of, well, what if we could just add source files to the compiler um, at build time? And rather than going through MS Build, the compiler would kind of provide this mechanism for you to add source files uh, directly, like an analyzer plugs into the compiler directly, and then all the analyzers are run when the compiler builds. Um, and then we also went to language design and said, hey, what kind of language features should we build for this? And so that we came up with like one language feature, which was um, replace and original. And the idea was that you would mark a method as original. Can we give a slight uh, review of partial classes so that that makes a yeah, yeah. sense? Because yeah. that's only in partial classes, right? Right, right. right. That okay. was only in partial classes. So the right. idea is we've, I mean, this is really a reinforcement of the fact that we've had source generation for forever. We have features mm -hmm. in C Sharp that were built entirely for source, source right. generation. Um, partial classes, most notably, it just allows you to take a class and split its declaration among multiple files. The idea was that uh, you could use it when you're writing code manually, but also right. you could use it when you're generating code. So you write part of your code uh, yourself, and then you have some kind of source generator come along and write out a partial class for one of your existing classes and kind of add functionality. And you would just have like a build time thing that, that spits out strings. Or Visual right? Studio. Right, to the file. Visual Studio does as well. A lot of people did T4 through Visual Studio. Lots exactly. of different ways to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. MS Build, Visual Studio, yeah. custom tools like the ResX generation right. thing. Mm -hmm. Like that. There's a bunch of different utilities that are mm -hmm. all built off the same idea. So we already have this partial class thing. And the idea was uh, if you're going to generate code, sometimes you want to generate code and um, you have a lot of problems that you wrote some code, but it wasn't exactly the, the, the code that you wanted to write. And so we said, OK, we can do a replace an original, wherein you write the method, you write your own method in your code marked with original, and then you spit out a new source file, and it has the replace keyword on the new method with the same signature. And the idea is that the new method replaces the old method. Can the new method call, can the, new method call the old method? There was some proposals around mechanisms for okay. that. It, it got very complicated. Okay. Like, yeah, the went. answer is you have all of the right questions because <laughs> we had those questions too and it started getting very complicated very quickly. Um, but moreover, as we started exploring this more, we realized there are kind of huge impacts on the rest of the ecosystem. Um, one of the key things is that you need to have the source generation. Uh, you need to have the generated files for a wide variety of just bog standard C-sharp analysis, like IntelliSense, or debugging, or edit and continue, or like any number yeah. of Visual Studio features, um, they all started depending on source generation. And moreover, it got really bad because if source generators could run at any time, and your code could be kind of half formed at any time, then the question of when does Visual Studio generate source it essentially came down to every keystroke. And that was per not. Performance problem. Yeah, that was not good. Performance, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good thing. So, so this is all the history. Yeah, so Everything this was all, up to this now's was, history. That's all three years ago. And okay. so we kind of stepped back and we're like, we can't just throw this out there and hope everything works out. That we have to have a plan for how we're going to make stuff like the entire IDE work. Um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not like we have to build every piece all at once and that we can't ship anything until it's done. But if we just throw stuff out, then we're going to end up in a really bad, there's a good chance we end up in a bad place that we can't fix. Right. And so that's just a general language design principle. And um, a great example of this is like uh, extension methods, where we said, oh, uh, we should add a, an extension system so that you can write a method on a class that you didn't write or that you have in a separate file just for organizational reasons or whatever. 
and people immediately came back, and this is a really common request these days. Um, I I should be able to write extension properties. Yes. Or extension like static extension methods like you extend onto a static class or something i want extension constructors actually extension constructors like yeah. all, all of these things right yes. <laughs> uh, and corefx just bugs us all the time for this um so the 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 problem with that was that we chose a specific syntax which uses the this keyword in the parameter list mm -hmm. properties don't have a parameter list yes and they do, uh, maybe. Well, <laughs> that doesn't help C sharp. <laughs> so the answer is we actually drove ourselves into kind of a syntactic hole. And if we had probably asked ourselves, so how would we add extension properties? The answer is we might have done extension methods completely differently. Right. And so we're thinking about that now. And we have kind of plans for extension methods and we have ideas about extension properties and all of these other things. But they're probably going to look a lot different from extension methods right. because we didn't kind of go ahead and do that. Yeah. So uh, avoiding that mistake for source generators. Yeah. What's that, on your mind to? So the, we now stepping back from three years ago into present day, um, we kind of like I went and I did a little bit of research and I tried to come up with some sketches about how what kind of problems we'd run into and how we would solve them when we encountered them. Uh, the first one was replace original just kept getting more and more complicated. Uh, and we get okay. we got a lot more questions about um, how do I know which method is actually going to be used here? Uh, and the answer was, well, looking at the original method, you can kind of look for replace methods in all of the partial classes that are generated in your solution. It, it wasn't like a great story. Um, I thought you just opened my let's buy. I mean, yeah. So the the first question was, maybe we don't need this. <laughs> uh, like, let's step back and see what people need, right? And how we can improve the process without kind of dumping this all this stuff that we don't have answers for all at once. I mean, we have done crazy stuff before, right? I think like in the .NET Core v one time frame, the ASP.NET team experimented heavily with intercepting the compilation unit and 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 basically rewriting it to whatever they wanted to, right? The problem with these kind of things is that you can also now create dialects of the language where you have like, you know, fake keywords with attributes and other stuff and then magically re rewrite stuff. The problem is not so much that you can't do it. I mean, you can do it today, but just, you know, writing a command line app that just uses Roslyn directly. But the problem at that point becomes, as you said, like the entire ecosystem, right? Tooling and all the other stuff just, that just falls apart. And I mean, we have seen this in other areas. I mean, T4 is decent, but the problem is that, again, like the, the design time experience was kind of left as an exercise for the reader. And then it's like, yeah, of course it gets the job done, but boy, is it ugly, right? And I think that's kind of the same problem, I think, across the board. I mean, C++ templates are powerful, macros are powerful, but yeah, the design time experience, uh, let's, rough. Is, uh, yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, it's great when it works, but it's really terrible when it doesn't. Well, um, there's two problems with the work that's been done before and, you know, it's a space I've been in for a really long time. And a couple of things have happened. One is that everything else we do has changed in a way where we need to generate code less often if you're writing normal business applications. So <clears throat> it was very different uh, 20 years yeah. ago. And so that has changed. Okay, we still need to do it a lot internally, and some people need to do it, but the, the whole how many people need to be doing this has, has dropped down. And that's let us focus on a couple of, of super key scenarios. And second of all is that we can't just rely on Visual Studio to do the, the work for us, which is the, was the story for T4, for one of the mechanisms for doing T4. Um, and the third thing is we don't have to do text anymore. Right. And so T4 and all the work that was done, almost all the generation work that was done up until like now, that was all done by producing text, which means that you don't have a valid compilation. You're then, oh, by the way, we'll also give you some text on this if you want to look at it for debugging and stuff. So I think it's, it's a great time to be looking at it one more time. Um, and uh, I guess I'm curious, you said you, you're not sure that we need replace, and replace was harder to do than you thought. I'm definitely one of the people yes. who asked for it. But like I said, a lot has changed in the world. I don't know how hard I'd ask today. Um, but uh, other than that, you talked about some other problems, like how are you going to get this actually accomplished in a way 
that is not going to throw performance out the window. How do you solve that problem? Yeah, can we do a demo for like what's the canonical thing that you think will be the common case for generators? Yeah, so there are a lot of canonical cases. I mean, a good one is ResX, right? Right. The ResX is what we do today. Do we have a demo? Um, do I don't have a demo. Did you, did you, we don't have any have code, code written. This is the no, I mean, like early you, you, planning. Like we have some yeah, code no, we, we, like we, Okay, so I have, so so, I have uh, uh, like early Andy requests. Andy did send some code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to show so the I code did. Andy sent. But demos. This is, <laughs> well, it is a demo. Yeah. It's, it's a it shows you the designer. code. Yeah, it's yeah. a language designer. Yeah, so the, the idea is that um, that I notify property changed is kind of the the – Old hand in this entire debate, like that. If you don't, don't solve know. that, you're you're you failed. It's, so you have to solve this one. It's one of the biggest requests yeah. for a long time for language features for a long time, and so it's also the one that everybody was uh, pushing for replace original because the initial idea. Well, let me let me back up a second and, and talk about where we landed in the new sure. set of uh, designs, which is maybe we don't need to replace original, maybe actually just adding source files is much more powerful than we think. Right. And that was one of the things that led us to kind of constraining the problem enough that we can kind of get a handle on it. And so uh, a good question is, oh, well, if you can't replace files, if you can't replace methods, how do you do I notify property change? Because you want to like insert calls or something into those methods. And the answer is that you actually don't need to replace the method. So this is the example implementation of iNotify property changed from the um, .NET docs, right? This is the just bog standard. You write your field, you write the property changed event, and then you write your uh, all your all of your properties, which return the field, and then set the field in the setter and call the property changed uh, method every time that. They're, they're called. The and that is what a person called. would write by hand. And this right? is normally what you would write by hand. I, this is out. Of, this is a little bit out of date, I've got to admit. With a name of. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the getter, you can have an expression body. You can use name of for the person name. Um, instead of doing a handler not equal to null, you can do handler question dot invoke. So, right, you can clean this up, but it's still a bunch of extra code. What idea. And you have to write, most importantly, you kind of have to write out the getter and setters manually every time because you need to insert this property change call into the setter. And so replace original, the idea was, oh, well, we can kind of like replace the original thing with uh, a on property changed call and then call the old thing. And that was how we kind of replaced, or that's how we kind of inserted into the, the code structure there. Um, and you would think that it would be very difficult to do it without a replace original. But it turns out, not only is it not that difficult, but it's shorter code if you don't do it that way. So if you scroll down, I have some like sample code of what it would look like with the source generator design that we're looking at today. Um, I've created this kind of phantom attribute called notify changed. You get that from somewhere, probably from the source generator library itself that, that implements I notify property changed. It's got this special notify changed attribute. And the idea is that the source generator uh, has access to the compilation. So the other part of this, the other key portion of this that was completely different from T4 templates is we have Roslyn now, which means that you can build uh, generators that actually have access to the compilation and have rich information about all of C Sharp. Yes. And there was no library for that. So that's the main, that's one of the main differences. And then... So basically this is the code that you would write by that's hand. That's the code that you would write by hand. And if you add this, and the idea is you add this notify changed, and this is all kind of the pattern of the source generator. The sort, mm -hmm. There's nothing mandated here by the language or the design. It's just this is how powerful the feature is that you can kind of... Yeah, thanks for fixing that up. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a few typos through here. Yeah, I wrote that. I wrote this by hand. So yeah. um, So but, this is what would be generated. Yeah, and then this is the generator. The, the idea is you the generator looks for this property. It's applied to the field. And then it knows that you're, it's inside an I, a, a class that implements I notify property changed, which means it knows, oh, well, I've got to implement the property changed event because that's required by the interface. And then I have all these fields and they need to have the property changed uh, code that, that generates for them. So the generator itself just writes out your properties for you. So you don't even need to, to write out any of the properties. You don't need to replace original. All you need to do is write out the fields 
uh, attributes, and then all of that code is generated for you. So one question was, how do you debug this? So the idea is that um, it's it's a really simple system, actually. Uh, it just changes compilation to be two-phase. The first phase, we have the compilation that's all the user code. And then we have the set of generators that were passed in, just like we have analyzers. Mm -hmm. In fact, the idea is that a generator assembly is essentially an analyzer assembly. We pass the compilation to all of the generators. They get to examine it. They get to spit out strings that is that are source code. And then we take all of those strings, all those additional text files, we parse them, we add them to a second compilation that contains all the user files and all the generated files, and that's the final compilation. And the, the cool idea there is that there's nothing different in the language after you do that. This is just C sharp. Uh, right. How you debug is, well, the generated files are included in the compilation. They'll be written out to disk as well. So you can see them, they're real files. They're on disk, they're right there. As you debug through, when you hit a generated call, you go into that generated call. There's like no magic here. There's no secret hooks or anything. Calls are calls. They call into the appropriate thing. And when you debug through them, you debug through the source. Right. So I want to confirm something there. So <clears throat> the generated files, the one we're looking at right now, um, that's in some not too obvious but accessible location. So if somebody wants to see what code is being generated for their application, they can actually go look at it. Yeah, right okay. now we're thinking Great. like some of this stuff. I this is still this is still really early. Yeah, like, yeah. But uh, we're thinking um, they'll go in the object obj directory right, under right, okay. like a generated files folder. There's okay. just going to be a right. new generated files folder, and they'll all go in there. But really. Right. If you're using Visual Studio, the experience should work just like it always does because the experience for Visual Studio is it has all the source files and it analyzes them all together. So right. if you hit go to def, well, it's a source file. It's just going to go to that definition. That file right. yeah. might be in the object directory, but it's still a file. It's still part of the compilation. Right. And by being in the object <laughs> directory, you solve one of the problems um, halfway. It's halfway solved. Uh, that people need to know what code is generated so they know not to change it and think anything's going to happen from that. And this probably helps with that because if you do change that oh, well, file... It'll be, it'll be marked read only <clears throat> in Visual right. Studio. Like you won't be able to just right, go right, ahead right. and change it. Well, uh, since about 2002, I've been asking for a different background for, for read only files. Uh, and maybe we can get that you know, around the same time. But uh, then we also have uh, where it's needed. We do have the normal partial method support that we already have for partial classes. So yeah. when there is a known piece that could be needing to be customized, then we already have that capability in uh, uh, in the, the partial class system. Yeah, and in fact, you can see that one of the changes that I made uh, to this to the original class was I made it partial. And the reason is because the generated code is in a partial class and the original code is in a partial right. class. So the idea is that um, there should be very little magic here. You right. shouldn't be scared about generated files because you can see them. They're part of your compilation. All right. of your tools continue to work. It's all real code. One thing that, that I find interesting is, so you said there's basically a two-step compilation, right? There's the logical, you load the, the, the user code as it is, and you pass that to the generator so they can inspect that. Yeah. But that thing is not necessarily free of errors, right? So for example, in your case, somebody else, like I, I, I rely on the generator to generate my properties, right? But then yeah. in my own user code, I might already reference them in because I expect them to be generated. So that means the first pass effectively will have errors with things that don't exist yeah, yet. Yeah, right? most of the first passes will actually be incorrect code. And the, I mean, the answer there is most code is incorrect. In <laughs> fact, the task of a compiler developer is not compiling correct code. You do that once. You compile incorrect code hundreds of times until people fix all their errors. Then you actually compile the correct code. So uh, we have a pretty robust error recovery system today. We might need to do more work on right. kind of making sure that experience all lines up. But yeah, you can expect that it's super common to have, say, a call to a stub that just doesn't exist yet. Right. I mean, like one of the things that I find frustrating with the C++ macros, for example, is that, you know, my, my kind of example would be, you know, in the old Win32 world, there was these macros that define message maps which effectively just compile down to generating methods in the globalized switch statement. But the problem is there's like multiple macros. There's like begin macros and end macros and like macros in the middle. If you fuck up one of those, 
you get effectively compiler errors that that are unintelligible, right? You have to know that, oh, because I didn't arrange them correctly, right? So in this case, the question would be if I if I let's say I forget the uh, I forget the uh, you know I, I don't mark this partial for example or I I don't add this attribute right yeah. then effectively now I get compiler errors that tell me that the property doesn't exist so like I now have to reverse engineer that this is the compiler error but the root cause is actually I just misconfigured my generator right like well the generator itself is also an analyzer so the idea is that the generator some of this experience is part of the generator uh, design where the generator has to say hey, what are the things that can screw up? Essentially, mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest, you got to play a little bit of compiler developer here and foresee the problems and kind of try and produce reasonable error messages that tell people, hey, um, this class wasn't partial, so I can't generate the appropriate code. Right. And then you can produce that error. And uh, if the generator produces the error, then presumably we won't actually go on to the second phase of analysis. Right. We'll just spit out the generator errors saying, um, like your generators say that your code is broken in a way that they can't recover from. Right. Um, and they could be warnings as well. So you can, you, you know, you can, you can customize it to exactly the scenario you need. That so, also means that you can provide fixes, right? So you can actually provide oh, a very tight integration where you can say, I can even see that you referenced person dot, uh, you know, name as a property and like capital N, but then I can also say, well, you didn't mark the field. So probably you should do that. Right. So like the, the author of the thing, because it has access to the compilation, it can actually do things that you wouldn't be able to do in macros because you don't have the ability to inject any intelligent code, right? You yep. just have to rely on the developer to not yeah. screw it up. Now I'm now I'm getting excited about the patterns <laughs> that we can do because there's a set of patterns that will run against probably all, most generators. Like uh, you've got two class names and one's not partial and that probably should have been partial kind of thing. Yep. And then potentially even maybe with some, um, the, the template author having, throwing in a little bit of intelligence or calling a library to do some checks or something like that. And then there's some checks that are just about is, is my metadata ready? Because the whole idea here is, you know, generation is always metadata plus template equals output. And here, the metadata is the Roslyn compilation of the source as the user wrote it. That's what the metadata is. Um, and and I, I happen to like one piece of that. I want to kind of get back to exactly what that means. And then <clears throat> the code, excuse me, <clears throat> the code does that uh, the alter, alteration based on the template and has the output. And so one of the things that we get in that in that process is one of the problems that you potentially have with source generators is order of operation. So one of the ways that generators have been considered before is that they work directly against the compilation, which means that one can change the metadata for the next, and the order in which they occur becomes hypercritical, and there's a lot of really hard things that can happen in that stream. It's too much from somebody who's a code generation geek. Uh, Andy and I both are, by the way. We have very different backgrounds on code generation, um, and one of the things we've, we've talked about is the fact there's so much less need of it than there was 20 years ago. Um, but now you're saying you're just creating new files. And if your files conflict with somebody else's new files, then you're going to have to figure that out. But it's going to be an obvious conflict in the created files that somebody can figure out how to resolve. So if I create a partial and it has a print method, and you create something that creates a partial that has a print method, and we, they have the same signature and they collide, it's an obvious thing for the, for the owner of the, of the code that said, I want your templates and your templates, and they can resolve it, which you can't do if you have a pipeline style of generation. So I really like that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. I was one of the people who asked for replace. Not, not quite sure on that yet. But I do think it's, it may be a really good way for us to finally get some uh, source generation support in the, in the inside of the C-sharp compiler. So uh, there's been a lot of ideas that have come along that I've been like, it's not all the way there. It's just not all the way there. But this could, this could work. We had some questions. We should go to questions. Yeah, yeah I, mean, the, I mean, one of the questions was like, uh, because it's generated code, like it doesn't live in version control, right? It's in the OBJ folder, so it's technically not checked in. Right. So how does that work when you have a production, uh, like the, 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 you just debug production code, basically? Like how do you get access to the source? Oh, so we, the, the answer is we're going to embed it by default in the PDB. 
That's so you like grab the, the binary, you grab the PDB, and you have all of the generated code directly in the application. The debugger will load it out and present you a file that has all the generated code in it just naturally. Like that that already works. I think it's already part of like the source link thing to say if the file is not under version control or if it's part of the if it's, if it's excluded basically by git ignore, it will be embedded, right? So it's basically you embed the ones that are not in source control and the ones that are in source control, you just use the linking. I believe. Yeah, I don't remember the exact heuristics that we use, yeah. but there's there's heuristics that say, oh, is this file generated then embedded inside the PDB by default? Um, right. And I think that and that, that's those are a set of features that have kind of come along uh, over the years, at, one by one, really. Right. Uh, so we're we're basically that's the other thing. Like we're kind of just taking advantage of a lot of progress that has been made, and just looking back on it. Um, we started to realize this thing is so powerful, even with all these restrictions. The restrictions that seem like heavy-handed, and yet it's still really, really powerful. And right. I've looked at a lot of examples, and it turns out you can write most of them without. You just have to be a little bit clever about it. Right. Um, and that's where like not modifying code comes in. So one person says, like, is there like is is the code generation tended to be checked in, or is it only during compilation? So that's a great question, and I think that it's probably going to differ based on um, exactly who you are and what you're doing. Uh, there's certainly, I, I think that there's certainly a use case where you would want to check it in. Um, we still have a little bit of work to do to figure out uh, a little bit about how to match up code that um, that was previously generated with code that will be generated. So naturally, if you don't include the generated code in your source as is. We still need some way to pass it to the compiler to say, hey, you, there's a generator for this compilation. It previously generated this file. And it's important to know that because you could use that information if the generator knows what the, the key is that decides what to generate. If that key is out of date, that is, if it's older than the generated file that got passed in, then we can use a simple like timestamp check Right. And say, well, you don't need to run that again. Right. So there's so certainly for people who are doing like um, very expensive source generation, they right. need to do some very complex thing. That would be really useful. On the other hand, if you're doing really cheap source generation, I think the idea is it's don't true. check it in, generate every time. Uh, it better. Yeah. Yeah, and and you get the magical benefit of it updates every time it right. needs to. Right. You you don't want you don't want stale code. Right. Is the idea. I mean, that's kind of the same thing that I saw with assembly info.cs, even though that is relatively simple in the old world. Like, it was a pain in the ass to actually maintain, right? Especially when you want to share it between projects, it became really hard. And with generated files, I've basically seen zero issues with that because it's always up to date and it never gets stale. Um, one other question that comes up is like, well, how does it relate to F sharp type providers and are we unifying this? <laughs> we. Um, they're a completely different system. Yeah. Like it, the it's, answer it's is totally F sharp type providers are built into the F sharp compiler. They're like really specific to F sharp. Um, they have uh, the answer is I'm also not an F sharp expert. So if Philip wants to come in and tell me all about how type providers work, that would be great. Philip should uh, be here next time. But the the details are there's a whole bunch of erase type stuff that is well known by the F sharp compiler, and they're just completely separate. Um, similarly, the generated source from C sharp. First of all, the input is a compilation. F sharp doesn't have a compilation. Right. So that's already a sticking point. And then also the generated source is C sharp. We, right. we ask you to generate a string. So if you generate a C sharp string, the F sharp compiler is not going to like that. <laughs> so the, the answer is like source generation by definition is a bit you know, it, it's a little bit specific to the source of the com code you're compiling. Yeah. So um, there's something in there that makes me curious. It says, at Michael Powell, that deserves a star just for the readme file. Is that what that says? No, he says that he, somebody else linked a, a GitHub repository that does something similar. Okay. And he comments Which on the readme. Should we, should yeah, we uh, there's a lot of, so there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, the biggest problem right now is uh, that it's really hard for people to get a hold of the information they need as the input to the generator. <laughs> yes. So MS build. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. MS Build, it's it's hard. 
uh, just getting stuff to run Talk to the PM. is hard. <laughs> Maintaining it is hard. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of it. It's and not my favorite part. It's risky. It's risky on breaks. But and, even, yeah. if, even if you get all that right, even if all you need to do is generate code not dependent on the user's source before running, that's hard. When you need to depend on the user's source, then yeah. it's really, really hard. It's basically yeah. impossible. In mm -hmm. order to generate a compilation that reflects how the compiler is actually going to use the code, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, and absolutely. the probability that somebody is going to insert some property in between when you run and when the, you grab the, the compiler's inputs mm -hmm. is really high. You're probably going to get wrong options or something. So the idea was, the compiler already has the right compilation. There's no other compilation that it could possibly have. Why can't we provide some mechanism to, yeah. to get in there? And also, there's just like, well, what if you're not using MS Build, right? What if you're using a custom build? You could be using Make, and that's fine. You call CSC directly, fine. Um, it's also not the greatest experience in some ways, but it works. And the source generation would work the same regardless. So we really wanted to kind of provide a simpler mechanism to get rid of a lot of that boilerplate as well. And that's that's one of the things that people struggle with. There are some libraries to improve that. But also, I got to say, heroic efforts out there, people. Uh, but you shouldn't you shouldn't have to do that. Right. right. Are you looking at uh, I was the looking at the story that was referenced? Yes, that was the that was Read Me Father to Drive the Star. Okay. So the yeah, I think what's the, the what's the URL for that? It's, it's uh, uh, this one. Yeah, code generation Rosalind. Okay. Uh, that I've seen that. That's really good. All of these. Yeah, and they, I think these we, got, are we have Michael. Similar. We have Michael Powell uh, is one of the people online. Is yep. that what I'm seeing? Yep. Great. Hi. Shout out. Thanks. This is uh, and thanks for the folks <clears> that brought this up. Uh, we are we are we do watch what goes on in the community, and like Andy says, we we really appreciate it when people step out ahead of us, and. Uh, uh, Michael, I hope you'll give us some feedback on what we're thinking about and what you heard uh, today. If we missed a, a comment in, as it went uh, by, uh, then I apologize for that because uh, it, uh, some of you may know I, I've been in this space forever and done a couple of things myself that actually didn't turn out in the end and know that there's some really big challenges um, along the lines. Uh, I attempted once to use Roslyn. I shout out somebody who's got that actually uh, working well. Um, and, oh yeah, uh, you can do the, it. It's just that you shouldn't have to. <laughs> well, and I think honest. we've come a long way with because when I was working on it, it was early in the the Ros Roslin's come a long way for its usability, mm -hmm. because of the focus on making uh, the the analyzers uh, a little bit more more a little bit easier to write than yep. they were. Um, the work I did seven eight years ago. Uh, was using didn't have that, and it just really it was it was it was actually such a nightmare that I worked on having an alternative interpreting the compilation and then working with that because I didn't care about performance at all because I wasn't going to run in real time. Yeah, and and the fact that now we can run in real time, and I also a big difference I think is that in two thousand. Um, the work, at least that I was doing then, was generating massive amounts of code. Um, an application might be 10% not generated, 90% generated. Massive, mm. massive. And I think we have so many other ways now to cut that down that now I do think that it will be uncommon. Um, in fact, I actually would encourage anyone who's looking at you know, more than a 10 or 15, 20% generation in an application to at least take a second look at it to see if there's other ways to... So now the amount of generation we're doing is more doable in re real time, which I think is fantastic. Actually being able to get IntelliSense on, you know, you, you generate a code as you type, you know, you type, you had name as your example, getting that. I don't know if this does that or not, but that's a, that's an absolutely huge uh, thing to be able to provide. I mean, it's a goal. Like, that's, that's the other thing. Before, there were so many open questions, we couldn't see a path for a lot of these things. Now, I think the, the main thing that, so Chris has been, Chris from the compiler team, uh, he's been working on kind of fleshing out a lot of the original ideas and actually going down these paths and making sure there are answers. That's the, right. that's the main thing that was necessary. We needed not necessarily solutions up front, but we needed to know that there were solutions and that we weren't going to back ourselves into a corner where actually IntelliSense doesn't work anymore. Right. That's never acceptable. I think that, I mean, the one-on-one problem that we face on our side is that 
you know, I work in the Core FX team and like we do a lot of, you know, performance work and other things. And like the, the number one challenge that we see with like, you know, large applications, whether they're internal or external, is that almost all of them rely to a somewhat unhealthy degree on reflection and reflection emit. And I think the large reason for that is that design time code generation is just plain sucks. It's hard to do. It's it's especially hard for library authors because you don't control the application, you don't control the build process of the application. So plugging your code in at the right time in MS Build for whatever you know crazy customized build process the consumer has is virtually impossible. And so that but reflection emit is nice because you do it at runtime, you know, the type system is much more simple at runtime. You don't have to worry about multiple languages or MS build or anything like that. But that also means performance is not great on initial startup because at some point the generation has to happen. Reflection usually results in you touching every assembly on disk because you have to discover the things you need to discover. And that's generally not great, right? And like any DI system suffers from this, right? Like you basically hit every file on disk. And uh, one of the hopes that we have is that we can leverage the code generation for some other stuff, right? So we just shipped the system text or JSON, like a high performance JSON stack. And uh, the serializer is something that you obviously could code gen, right? You could obviously have some code that says, given a writer, you know, I just read and write the properties, you know, one by one. And the, the code is pretty simple, and the reflection code that you would have to emit at runtime is is not that simple, and like that could significantly improve the performance of the uh, of the serializer. But the challenge here again is like how do you make it composable, right? When you have multiple different types from different assemblies, how how do you generate a, a, a thing for that, right? In all cases, and uh, I think that will be one of the challenges we have to figure out, and that's why I'm I'm very interested to see how we yeah that was how one, we how we can do that. That was one of my original motivations. I was I the first thing that I wrote when I was cr trying to like explore the space was a 100% allocation free JSON serializer because that's exactly what I wanted to do and right. that that kind of getting reflection out of the way not just because it's expensive which it is <laughs> it's platform dependent which it is yes uh, but because it's often wrong um, <laughs> the code that I want to write is against the types that I see as the developer not whatever happens to be on the machine at runtime but what I actually see um, and I know that there are uses where, where you actually want to use the runtime type, but that wasn't what I wanted. Right. And so that this is like a completely different approach. No, and it's like some person comments and says like it's even harder than JVM due to type erasure. But even in .NET, like the, some of the concepts we have in source do not have a corresponding IL issue, right? Or IL feature, I guess. So there's already some cases where depending on what you want to do, it might be significantly harder for you to do if you can't actually you know reason about types in the in the context of uh, of c sharps types right and i feel like that is something that if we if we get more um fidelity and more performance and we get more people to use generators as opposed to reflection emit i think everybody is better off especially when you combine reflection emit with platforms that don't allow you to jit like ios for example yeah, that's, right? like that that's yeah. uh, it that, gets yeah. complicated fast done at five it's going to bring some new uh some new ways of thinking <coughs> for as we sure move towards having uh head time compilation as well as jet so yeah yeah although my my general um cautionary tale to everybody is uh your generated code actually runs so um don't do too much of it yeah one person <laughs> says generation should be done from models not from c sharp <laughs> classes i think that it, that depends right if you generate like you know Pocos from a database schema, then clearly you're not starting from a C sharp schema, right? But the property or info, protobuf. yeah, protobuf, right? CRPC. But you know. but like if you look at things like <clears throat> I probably notified change or other things like logging, other concepts you may want to do, like it seems much more easier if you can actually inspect the the C sharp code because that is your declaration of what you want the generator to do. So and, and I just add that I think we have some good uh, some good answers for the. That separated ahead of time, you know, you're going to have a tool that does that sort of before you get into your C sharp code, um, and <clears throat> that would be uh, T Force One. And I'm trying to think of the name um, Liquid. Uh, well, Liquid coming out of the Ruby space. There's some others out there. I think we've got solutions for that. What we don't have solutions for right now is that uh, that real time. I've got a class I want to do. I notify property change. I want to do serialization. I want to do something like that. And that's what we uh, can but add with this. Also, hitting the protobuf <laughs> cases is absolutely a design goal. Is it? Right. Yeah. So the idea is we have a flag right now called additional files. And its oh. analyzers just pass in whatever file they want. 
And the idea is that they get to be seen by the analyzer. They're not input to the C-sharp compilation, but the analyzer can use them however. So the idea is, oh, you want to write a generation for gRPC or whatever, pass in your .protobuf files or .proto files as okay. additional files, and then spit C-sharp code for them. But you're not going to be able to cache that very easily in memory, right? You're going to have to read that every time? No, we'll probably cache it in memory in the okay. same way that we do for okay. all additional files. We read by cache, I really mean we read out the file. We read the file off disk. Okay. But, but that's necessary for everything. And it, all <laughs> right, inputs to the compiler have to be read. You're parsing it. You have to parse it. Uh, if it's an additional, time you run it if it's an additional file, file, it doesn't go through parsing. Does it's just it's a flat text file. So the generator okay. is in control of how much essentially computation they want to do on the and file. And then does it stay, does the, does the generator stay in memory specific to that compilation as long as the, the overall, as long as that basically project is still live in as a compilation? The generator, the it generator stays live? assembly will be loaded okay. into an assembly look just like, so it, to describe, I, the answer is none of this is built, so there aren't technically <laughs> answers for this. Yeah. But, um, mm. If it's using the same, the idea is to use the same uh, infrastructure as our analyzer infrastructure. Right. In which right. case, if you load the assembly, then it's loaded into the process in uh, in an assembly load context in core and a uh, um, separate process on Windows. Uh, right? Whatever it's called, the desktop thing. App uh, domains. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> app domains. <laughs> I right. that code all is right. a nightmare. So um, all right. So I'm I'm curious about that because. I certainly had thought about this in the limited space of the real-time uh, compilation problems. The, I'm sorry, the real-time generation problems. And I had expected that protobuf, et cetera, would stay out in the liquid or T4 space. And you're saying, no, we'll do that too. Why not? All right. Additional file awesome. and then run it. Right. <clears throat> so one question is, I'm not, I'm not sure that is his intent, but like it sounds like what he's yeah. asking is, can the generator basically live in the same solution? Uh, so the the trick with all of those things is assembly load. That um, assembly unload. <laughs> I was going to say no, it's not assembly load. Yeah, it's, it's unload. actually it's assembly unload. unload that's the problem, <laughs> right? So uh, if you can't unload the assembly, then you can't actually you you can't rebuild the assembly and load it again, right? You would have to shut down Visual Studio. Or, so the answer is probably these are technically solvable problems. Um, certainly with analyzers, I think some of them got less focus. Uh, analyzer assemblies, you they load you load them once and then they're loaded forever. But you can't have a, an analyzer project in the same solution that wants to consume them. There's no project reference to an analyzer, right? Uh, there's an analyzer path. There's, so what happens is you have to essentially have a condition upon the, the project building. And then there's an analyzer DLL that gets created. And then the next project, the one that consumes the analyzer, needs to load that DLL. It's not a project to project reference thing because these aren't references, right? right. They're actually loaded DLLs. So you have to omit that, um, the actual analyzer assembly to metadata. And then the compiler has to load that assembly in order to provide analysis. So basically, what you're saying is so like, the idea you is if you change it. the analyzer, in the if in the same Visual Studio session you build once that analyzer assembly got emitted to disk and then loaded by the compiler. If you then change the analyzer and rebuild, well, the analyzer assembly is already loaded in the process, meaning that you can't reload we used without to... unloading that original thing. So we... the answer is, yeah. I think that you can probably do some stuff like if you have an assembly unload with assembly load context, then you could simply unload the assembly. You could also load it in a background process and then kill the process. Like there, there are a variety of different technical solutions to this problem, some of them more complicated than others. If it's that important of a scenario, I yeah. think we could solve but them. In the meantime, we, we've been using, for all the Visual Studio uh, stuff that I've done, I just use an experimental instance and that works today. Right. So you and you can, can always... just shut down your experimental instance without uh, without too much effort, and you can then do remote sure. debugging and stuff. And you know, it, it's I recall it's been a little while, but and yeah. Mo most of the time, you're not revving the analyzer at the same time. Like, it, it, it's an important development scenario. Exactly. Like if you're building the analyzer, but then <clears throat> the answer is you probably don't want to. 
you don't necessarily want to build your analyzer against your real world solution anyway. You want to build it against unit tests because it's easier to get feedback and stuff. And we have a unit test framework for analyzers built in. So you actually would prefer to, to kind of use the unit testing. Well, I would prefer that you use the unit testing scenario to narrow in on the behavior of your analyzer ensure that it's the correct behavior in a variety of different circumstances that are not necessarily your real world project right now at this very second, um, and then ship the analyzer appropriately. Yeah, so um, if you have a scenario where you think the uh, generator needs to be in the solution as a sort of a, a, a core part of the, of the user story, the core part of what you're trying to accomplish, it'd be really good to know about that uh, so that we can kind of figure out what priority to put on this notion um, of being able to update the generator in closer to real time. Yeah, I mean, we, we oh. have a generated code as part of our build um, that we use today in Roslyn. And the answer is we just run it separately. Like, it's honestly, it's not that big a deal. So it would have to be, um, it, there are certainly scenarios that I can see where it's useful. Uh, I would have to weight it against other scenarios for importance. Yeah. I think the so, idea would be that you can just basically like, like things like the 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 bound notes model, for example, in Roslyn is very specific to Roslyn, right? The idea that I ship a NuGet package for that seems overkill, considering that the only consumer of this will be in the same in the same yeah, project. Yeah, I didn't say so. It's not necessarily that you ship a NuGet package; it's that you want it just in a separate part of the solution. It's about a build sure. phase. Sure, basically, it's, yeah, it's basically you have a multi stage. Ordering, yes, right? yes. So that's yes. that's all it is. You don't necessarily need to ship everything as a NuGet package, but you can just phase the build such that, and yeah, during the development time period, it can be expensive to change the generator because you have to close Visual Studio and reopen it. Right. And so that's the kind. That's the thing that we would improve upon. That when you're <laughs> developing the generator and running it against real world apps, that might be something that could use improvement. So I have a feeling we could talk about this. All day long. All day long. So we have a couple. Do we have any questions uh, that are in there right now that we want to do? Um, I'm not sure what the WTF is against, um, but. Uh, well, I can say this all day long too. Like this. Right, right. No, I was just saying if there was anything that we wanted to. The, the very last question up there was not really a question, uh, and I'm not quite sure what it referred to. Um, yeah, so the domain comment was from the compiler standpoint. I'm actually looking forward to Yeah, from the comments. compiler standpoint. That's yeah. The, yeah. the entire, the reason that everything would be loaded is that it's faster. Like, it's just a performance optimization. The thing that you can't do today is uh, load the Roslyn <laughs> solution like and then also use this that compilation in the same process for for the actual compilation. So anybody who's doing this today loads Roslyn and all of the files, and then kind of does whatever generation they want to do, and then calls the compiler. Right. So you've loaded all of the stuff for for the actual compilation, and then added more stuff, and then the Roslyn compiler will go and load all of the same stuff again, and then load your new stuff. So in addition to all of the process overhead, the jitting, the .NET start, like process startup, like all of that, Plus all of the extra file I/O, extra analysis. That's the that's the thing that you can save by doing it all in the same process. Somebody asks, when can we have it? And the answer is, we don't know. Yeah, no idea. It's oh, in development. Sorry. Like we're working on it right now. This <clears> is <throat> this is early stages. Chris is uh, making like huge progress. We just added a design document to the Rosalind repository. I think it's under features slash source generator branch. That's C Sharp Lang or yeah, Rosalind? Uh, no, on, on Rosalind. Rosalind. In fact, okay. that's the thing. There's no C Sharp language changes. The language is identical. This is entirely a compiler feature. Um, right. And that's one of the things that kind of pushed <clears throat> us toward, oh yeah, we can do this. Like This is scoped down enough that we can understand it. Okay. Um, obviously, language changes are always uh, possible in the future. But right now we're saying, look, this is hugely powerful even without Let's do them. it. Yeah. Okay. And, but it's so it's it, it's for .NET five though, right? Like it, it, it won't for, happen before .NET five is probably the best way to say it. Right. There's no ship vehicle before .NET five. We're gonna have lots of runway, you know, May, June, July when we're just really telling you what yeah. we're doing. Um it you know, it doesn't hurt to let us know if you think it's important, doesn't hurt to uh 
you know, reach out, uh, you know, on the document, on the design document, if if you say really, really want this, as well as telling us what you uh, what you like and don't like it uh, about it. That that never hurts, but uh, it it'll be prioritized along with some other important things we're talking about, including records, including you know some other smaller features, and uh, I don't even know what else we have on the table right now. I've missed so many meetings. It's we have a bunch of stuff bunch piling of stuff. up in LDM. But uh, that it's more about like, yeah, the, the design documents, devs. figuring yeah, yeah. out exactly what, what we want to build, how we're going to build it, um, how we're going to address those scenarios that I talked about at the beginning of um, when can you not run a generator? Like really that's, that's the thing that got us stuck last time. And we think we have answers to that now with, oh, uh, you can kind of have a progressive enhancement story for an analyzer where you have you set certain triggers saying my generator only depends on say this dot proto oh, file okay. okay therefore if that dot proto file doesn't change don't we do don't me. run the rerun the generator and so that's excellent we don't promise that we're going to get all that delivered in v1 but, but we have a plan we have a plan which is actually what's what's letting us do this how do you stuff. think the timestamp will be enough on that um in this case it's not necessarily the timestamp. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a trigger of some it, sort. It's a trigger of some sort. And Got it. in that case, you could just say, I only depend on dot proto files. And if you're not changing your proto files, nothing then happens, nothing happens. So a, a user typing in a C sharp method, for example, won't change anything. Doesn't doesn't matter. Oh, like excellent. For, okay. Forget the, the timestamps. Like they're just you don't Okay. We, so, we know uh, whether or not you're editing it. them. Got it. Okay. Cool. All right, so uh, I think we should probably wrap we're up. We're going to have to close, man. I'm I'm really looking forward to reading these comments that have scrolled by. Um, you see me squint every once in a while because I can't actually quite read <laughs> these comments from across the room. Uh, but I really am so thrilled that we got this conversation going in the background, even though uh, we did a uh, we we didn't get all the questions answered. I don't think, but I'm. I'm really glad that we had this conversation. Really glad to uh, see what what uh, Michael Scott uh, got there in the Roslyn generators, and uh, really excited to see the space get revived. Um, you know, I was trying to do this 20 years ago, and it's going to be a heck of a lot easier now, that's for sure. Sounds good. So, like, I mean, yeah, like the only call to action that I think I have for the rest of you: download .NET Core 3.1, play with it, give us feedback. Um, Stay tuned. Like we will, you know, share more links to documents that you can read. Like uh, it's always hard to understand a design, but just watching three people chatting about it, it's always easier to actually have bits or at least a design document. And they will also come. I think uh, as we are starting to plan more for five o, the idea is also we will share more of the design documents for five o to ask for more feedback. Yeah, um, one thing we're working on now for source generators is kind of a series of design patterns. Ways we think that you'll be able to kind of examples of stuff like I notify property changed. Like, do you want to generate I no notify property changed? Here does here's a design pattern that you could use, um, and kind of you use that to make your own stuff. Is that in the design document? That's the design. Where is that? The design document is on Roslyn uh, inside the source. I These, think under docs. There's the there's a docs folder on on the Roslyn repository. And uh, it's under the features slash source generation folder. Okay. I think it would be awesome if we found a way for people to be able to um, feed into that uh, patterns conversation because we might find people with a different additional ways to do the iNotify uh, property well, that, change pattern. Yeah, that's the other and, thing. Uh, like getting, getting some feedback for different ways people think they want to do things. Um, I was looking at that going, hmm, I wonder if I just want an attribute with a name and not having that, you know, so I think that'd be awesome to get people's feedback. Yeah. On that. Oh, boy, we've, we've, uh, is that the right one? We've talked way past the end of our time today. Yeah, that's it. Um, cool. Docs, features, gener wow. When was this merged? Well, it says uh, right here, right? November 10. No, this is not the right one. Okay, then. Don't use branch. this link. Don't use this link. <laughs> Brand. Search for features, source generators. And uh, there. Um, just go to the pull request. We will get you the right link here. Stay tuned. We think magic will happen. Slow in this room. It is.
Okay. Check to see what file was changed. Watching a scroll bar. Docs features source generators.md. All right. And that's go. in the features source generators branch. So that would be, we can probably do this, right? I have no idea whether or not that's going to work. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> Why would it not work? Doc? Oh, because it's docs. Sorry. Can we get a link to this in, I guess we don't really, do we like have a file or anything we put out with this? Resources? I don't think we do. We should work on that. There you go. All right. That should be the right one. Do we get a link? That is the link. <clears throat> Excellent. So uh, thanks for sticking with us, folks. We talked way too long today. We have done this before, but we're at an hour and a half right now for an hour long uh, community stand up. And I think it's time for all our sakes for us to call it a day and uh, get on with, with what else you all are doing today. And uh, thanks again. For meetings. Meetings. And Meetings. Mm. Deleting more hopefully, email. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right. Mostly <laughs> meetings. All right. Bye-bye.